Do you see my, do you see my yes. correct screen? Yes. Okay. So hello everyone. Thanks for joining. This is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shi Xiang Wang, who is a staff research scientist at IBM TJ Watson Research Center, New York, United States. He received his PhD from Imperial College London, United Kingdom in 2015. His current research focuses on the intersection of distributed computing, machine learning, networking, and optimization. With a broad range of applications, including data analytics, edge-based artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and future wireless systems. He received the IEEE Communication Society, Leonard G. Abraham Prize in 2021, IEEE Comsight Best Young Professional Award in Industry in 2021, IBM Outstanding Technical Achievement Award in 2019, 2021, and 2022, and multiple invention achievement awards from IBM since 2016. For more details, you can visit his website, which is shichiang.one. So uh, seminar series, this webinar series is called Federated Education or Feducation, in a sense that we want to make it accessible to everyone. So we are going to share the files with any students who missed this talk. So with this, I would like to ask Dr. Wang to start. Shi Chiang, thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm very glad to be here and to share some recent work on federated learning um, and in particular federated learning with dynamic resource availability, where the resource here means like communication bandwidth or computation uh, uh, cycles and so on, which I will um, go more into details in just a couple of, of slides. Um, so before I get to all the details, maybe just a very brief recap on what is federated learning and why it is useful. Um, I see that this is a series on federated learning, so probably people already know what it is, but just to have a very broad idea. Um, so basically we all know that machine learning requires data. And uh, the amount of data at one single device is usually too small to train a good model. And here you can talk about like mobile phones, for example, you may collect some data locally. You want to um, enable some AI applications using such data. But uh, of course, if you just look at the data collected one, uh, at one client or one device, that is uh, not enough. But then at the same time, you cannot send all the devices data to a central cloud because of, um, uh, issues like privacy regulations, such as the GDPR and some other uh, related or similar regulations that have been passed um, in different countries in recent years. And also um, uh, the other problem is communication bandwidth limitation. For example, as we see in these figures here, is like the amount of data that we generate grows exponentially over um, year by year, but uh, the communication bandwidth is not really growing um, as fast as the amount of data that we generate. So basically um, this leads to um, this notion of federated learning. And the idea is that we can collaboratively train a model with um, only sharing a relatively small amount of information between clients and the cloud. So instead of sharing all the data, we usually um, send over model parameters. And what I'm going to talk about in this talk is like we can compress the model parameters so that you don't have to send the whole model. Um, and um, of course, this also solves some um, privacy related issues like we don't share raw data. We can share model updates in um, some privacy preserving ways such as secure aggregation that I won't cover in this talk, but there are related papers and articles about that as well. And uh, some other benefits include like, um, so during the training, the clients who participate in this training process, they can access the model immediately without having to wait until the whole training has finished because um, what the server sends down to the clients here, they just also include the global model. So it's basically the global model parameter or the global or the update of the global model parameter that will be sent down to each client. And there has been works on resource efficiency, uh, privacy preservation, et cetera. But one challenge that um, kind of uh, gained attention only in recent years, I would say, is this issue of um, this kind of dynamic resource availability, uh, availability in federated learning systems. 
right? Um, so what we mean by this is that so if you look at a traditional federated averaging algorithm, let's say um, that I will introduce um, in a bit more details in the next couple of slides, but essentially um, the traditional algorithm is doing something like this. So you do some local computation and then you will communicate with a server. Each client communicates with a server and then the server sends down the model parameter down to each client. The clients compute again for a certain a number of steps and then it communicates with the server and so on. Um, so this is like sort of an ideal situation where uh, let's say all the clients are able to compute at the same time and communicate with the server at the same time as well. But in reality, what we often see is, um, or it could be something like this, right? Because you have a lot of different tasks going on in the whole network system including on the client devices, um, because the, the primary goal of having a device like a mobile phone is not to do model training. You might be uh, watching a video or you might be playing a game on this mobile phone. And of course, we can also talk about things beyond mobile phones like you have an edge server in some store, let's say, and they would probably process some transaction information. So all those are computation workloads. And um, for federated learning, we should usually only use the idle cycles so when the server or the device is not doing anything, then we could use that um, computational cycle for model training. So, and, and the same for communication bandwidth as well. You may have periods with high bandwidth available or low bandwidth available. So what ends up is something that we show here. So you may only be able to compute at certain times and communicate with the server at some other times. And this could be highly asynchronous across the different clients. And um, basically this makes the whole federated learning process quite challenging uh, because we need to um, somehow, um, because this is like, let's say there's a given constraint on how much resource we have, but we still want to design a federated learning algorithm so that you can converge to a global model that works well for all the clients. Right, so this is, um, or this kind of a scenario is what I will focus today in this talk. And uh, there are two specific topics that I would address. So one is to determine whether and how much to communicate or compute based on the target resource usage. Um, and uh, in the later formulation, we will capture the resource usage in the form of a cost function. Um, essentially is to say that if at some point, the available resource is very scarce, then I would say um, using this resource incurs a higher cost. And uh, if the resource is more abundant, then I would say um, the resource cost is lower. And then I will have an average cost constraint for each device's computation and communication, and also for communication from the server to each device. Um, so the other topic is also related to this. Um, so at the end of the first topic, we will see that um, the whole algorithm that I will present works for cases when the client participation is somewhat regular, I would say. It's, like, it's, it's not like they are disconnected for several hours, for example. But what happens if some clients are disconnected for an extended period of time, such as several hours, right? which can be possible if, um, for example, you're training on mobile phones and then you may want to say the mobile phone only wants to participate in training when it's connected to the power because it doesn't want to drain its battery when someone is outside and uh, they may need to use the phone later on, right? So in this case, um, there is a kind of a twist of the federated averaging algorithm that we can make um, to make the whole training process much more efficient when the clients can possibly disconnect for an extended period of time. So just a quick outline um, related to the two topics that I just explained. So I will start with a little bit uh, more mathematical formulation and uh, explanation of the federated averaging algorithm. This is like a very standard algorithm for federated learning. And then I will present um, basically the first topic that we call a flexible federated learning algorithm, which includes a control and or optimization mechanism to optimize the communication and computation rates. And then we will talk about how to overcome intermittent client participation 
Here we will introduce um, something that we call an amplification of updates to make the whole learning process work better if the clients can disconnect from time to time or for, for some period of time, let's say. And we will also present some convergence analysis results for this new algorithm. And in the end, I will also have one slide to um, uh, just explain federated learning in a bigger picture. Right, so let's move on. Um, and by the way, if there's any question, feel free to interrupt or enter your question in the chat box. Um, so let's start with the mathematical formulation of federated learning, right? Um, and basically um, a machine learning model is usually parameterized with uh, some trainable parameters and we denote all the trainable parameters as the vector X here. And uh, as in all machine learning problems, we also have a loss function. The loss function captures how well is my model with parameter X fitting my training data set. And uh, let's say this uh, C here is, a, is some data sample from my training data set. Um, so basically um, what I'm using this loss function to capture is the error that my prediction is for this specific data sample. And if you talk about classification problems, then it's usually the difference between the labels, um, or the, let's say the label predicted by the model and the ground truth label that, um, that's provided by the training data. So in the federated setting, what we have is like, we have a local objective at each client N, and this is defined as the expectation over the client N's data distribution, um, and it's the expectation of the loss function um, where this data is taken from the client's data distribution. So now we also have a global objective, which is the average of all the local objectives. The characteristic of federated learning is that the global objective is not directly observable uh, because we don't have access to all the local data. So only the local objectives are observable and we only exchange the parameter updates with the server. We don't exchange the data with the server. But still the overall problem is to minimize the global objective. So this means that we have to solve this in a distributed way which is essentially what federated averaging is doing because um, we only have access to local data. We have to evaluate the gradient of each local objective on the device, and we can send the gradient updates to the server uh, so that um, we will converge to a global solution in the end. So these are the key steps of federated averaging. So we start with the server sending the parameters down to each client, then the client performs. Um, let's say I steps of local updates on its own data set and uh, the, the loss function computed on its own data set. And it sends the updates back to the server. The server aggregates all these updates uh, and uh, obtains a new model parameter vector is xt plus one in the next uh, time slot or next round, let's say. And then it sends the model parameter down to the client again for the next rounds of updates. So this is simple. Now, if you have resource constraints as what we said before, um, one thing that we can do is, um, so we can use compression uh, to compress the updates um, of model parameter updates sent between clients and the server. And we can do both uplink compression and downlink compression in this case. And also at the same time, we can do partial computation and um, or sometimes it's called partial participation. So the idea here is like there are certain rounds where some of these clients, or maybe in some cases, actually most of the clients may not participate in training uh, because it's either not connected to the power and may not have the resource, or um, uh, it's just, um, I mean, some other work that we don't discuss today, but there, there's also a reason like if some clients are have very similar data sets with other clients, then not all, all of them need to participate at once. Right, um, so, so this looks kind of simple, but one thing to, uh, remind, uh, to, to be mindful here is that we should not always, or, or we cannot just naively do a compression. Let's say you do some quantization or some specification, um, and here you just randomly um, uh, 
not say that I'm trying to participate. I mean, that, that is okay, but usually in the algorithm, we have to have some additional steps so that uh, we can still guarantee convergence with this compression and partial computation uh, kind of um, control knobs, let's say, right? So um, because if you, if you just arbitrarily compress, then maybe the update will become very different from what you would do without compression. And in that case, maybe the resulting model will be not good. But if we compress and do some error correction that I will explain in the next slide, then we can still guarantee a good model and um, a reasonably good convergence rate. So this basically um, brings us to this uh, flexible federated learning algorithm. Um, if you're familiar with federated learning, you will probably see some key steps here. Like we send all the local updates to the server, the server aggregates all these updates, and then it sends the updates to the client. So some of these parts, they look very similar to the standard federated averaging algorithm. But what's different is that, um, so basically we have these three parameters here. Um, and um, the first one is related to computation. And it's a probability of uh, computing in a certain round T. And this probability, as we see later, could depend on uh, the resource consumption or the resource cost at a certain round and this resource cost, cost could vary across rounds as we said before because the resource availability is time varying um, but just for the algorithm here let's say uh, these uh, this probability is given to us and then uh, we do a random sampling according to a Bernoulli distribution that follows this probability and we um, perform updates only if the outcome of the sampling is one. Um, in other words, this is an identity function. It's either zero or one. If it's zero, then in this case, I don't really do anything. Although mathematically, I would still multiply that with a stochastic gradient. But in reality, I just don't do any computation and I don't have any update here. Uh, if it's one, then that means my client is participating in this round and uh, I will make this um, update. And after the update, what we can see in these three lines is that, um, so there are some variables here, the mo most important or unique one related to compression or uh, actually compression with error feedback here is this vector E and also at the server side is vector R. So what this is doing is like, so after we compute these local updates, usually if you don't do compression, then we will just send these, um, this update, which is the, stochastic gradient multiplied by the learning rate directly to the server. But with compression, what we do is like, we first accumulate this in this kind of an arrow vector, or basically this is um, an accumulated update that um, has been accumulated over all the past rounds and those that have not been sent to the server yet. So we, we put, all these values in this vector. And then when we decide which parameters to send to the server, we will be based on this um, whole vector, which includes the new update and also the previous residual updates that have not been sent to the server yet. And we will decide which ones to send to the server. And those components that are sent to the server, they will be subtracted from this vector B. So one example here is um, we can do a top case classification on the vector B, for example, essentially is to say that, um, let's say we are specifying some percentage of components that we would like to transmit to the server. And um, we will find uh, among all the components in vector B, which ones have the maximum magnitude. And we send the, let's say 5% of components that have the maximum magnitude to the server. Uh, and the reason is that in this way, our resulting uh, like residual error will be small. Um, and, and like intuitively this makes sense because you want to send updates in a way that um, the most important updates are transmitted and um, the server model gets updated using the most important updates because those, those updates um, have large magnitudes so they are more important, right? And then 
uh, we can keep the, the less important ones locally and maybe in some future time they will become more important and then we can send those to the server uh, at that time. So at the server, time, uh, at the server side is the same. Uh, we accumulate all the updates received from clients. And, um, and this one again is a temporary vector A. This is just um, the residual error plus the updates, the newly, update, newly received updates. And uh, we can do the same kind of a top case classification or some other compression methods as well, just to determine which updates to send to the clients and the remaining updates will be stored in this V0 error vector are at the server side. So now we have these three different parameters. What's interesting is that in the convergence upper bound, we can see that these uh, three uh, parameters, um, like including the probability Q and uh, the residual error vectors E and R, so they directly appear in this convergence upper bound. So um, what this means is that if we design a control algorithm, we would like to make uh, these residual errors as small as possible. We would like to make the participation probability as large as possible so that we have a good convergence guarantee. Right. And using this convergence upper bound to estimate um, the actual performance of learning. So this has been done in many papers over the last couple of years. And the reason that we have to use convergence upper bounds to approximate is because we don't know how exactly the choice of a compression rate and a computation rate would affect the training otherwise, because um, in order to know exactly how it works, you would have to have the model trained already. But using the convergence upper bound is just um, a way for us to approximate and to understand like what are the choices that I should take without actually having trained the full model. And then I can make decisions over and over again during the training process so that, um, so that we, we will be more efficient essentially and within the resource budget and whatever without having to train a model multiple times. So just following like the similar idea, so we use the convergence upper bound as a surrogate to optimize our training process. And here I just rewrite the convergence upper bound in a slightly different way, because I know that my original residual errors are, errors are zero. So I can start from um, the first round t equals to one, and I can express that using RT, so basically, this um, gives this form. So this is just to replace the definitions of AT and BT from the algorithm into the convergence bound. And um, the reason we do this is because we want uh, things like, um, like some of these parameters to be more visible in this optimization formulation, right? But our objective, function now is something like this. So we would like to minimize the convergence upper bound under these constraints. So these constraints are time average cost constraints related to both computation and communication costs. In particular, uh, this uh, cost lambda here is the computation cost. And this is proportional to the probability of computation Q. Uh, so this one is usually proportional to Q, or at least it's increasing in Q. Um, and this one is the client to server communication cost. And this is um, the server to client communication cost. So we have these three cost constraints. These costs could be time dependent. They can be very different across different rounds. Um, but all that we say is that on average, let's say after T rounds, uh, my total cost or my, my average cost does not or should not exceed a certain target. So this could be something that we say is a budget that we uh, allow for training a model. Right now, so, so th there are several challenges in solving this problem directly. Although we've already made an approximation using the convergence upper bound, so we use the upper bound to kind of approximate how the training would involve. 
but there are still challenges. For example, if I want to solve for Q here, the Q appears in both the last term and the second term, uh, but uh, the problem is that in the second term, you also have this uh, random identity function that is sampled according to a Bernoulli distribution with a probability Q. So that means if we don't know Q, then we don't know this identity. But if we know the identity, then um, there's kind of no need to know the Q anymore. Um, so, so, so that's why it's like, if you want to solve for this objective function directly, it will be very difficult. We might have to expand all these norms in a certain way, but then the other thing is that we don't know the gradients um, in practice before we know that I is, uh, this identity is equal to one. Um, because of these complexities, we make a sequential approximation here. Um, essentially what we are saying is like, we approximately solve these terms one by one. So we first find all the Qs and then we find uh, the vector V. V is uh, what is transmitted from clients to the server. And then we find the server to client communication um, kind of um, uh, basically the information that's transmitted from the server to the client that's something that we, uh, we denote by U here. So we solve these three problems separately now, but there's still a challenge because all these objective functions are uh, and constraints, they are time average over T, right? So that means if I would solve this directly, I should somehow know how the system would behave in the future, which is usually not possible. So that's why to solve each of these problems 2.1 to 2.3, you will further make um, an um, approximation that uh, people have been using a, a method that people have used for uh, a networking optimization uh, in some other work before, which is called this uh, draft plus uh, drift plus penalty formulation. Uh, essentially, the drift means the Lyapunov drift, and the penalty is um, the uh, object objective function that we have. Um, in the interest of time, I, I probably won't go into all the details here, but the main idea is that we will capture all the constraints in these um, uh, previous problems as a virtual queue. And the length of the virtual queue captures how much I have violated this constraint. So if I violate the constraint, then all the violations will be captured in the queue. Um, as long as over time the queue length is bounded, then let's say if you allow t going to infinity, you would um, have an average constraint that is uh, as close as possible, um, satisfying these um, upper bounds that we have here. So now uh, by defining these virtual queues and uh, doing this uh, Lyapunov drift upper bound, so basically we will get online optimization problems as follows. Um, these problems in the in these problems, the first terms they are exactly the same as what we have in these expectations here. Um, but the second term is what we call this uh, Lyapunov drift, or actually an upper bound of Lyapunov drift, which is essentially uh, capturing these um, Q violations. So what this means is like if let's say we look at uh, the the first problem here, if we have a large virtual Q then um, this, const, uh, the, this parameter will be very large. And that means I would be um, a very unlikely to violate my average constraint more for this particular round. So, so if, if, if the virtual Q length is large, then it's quite likely that I would like the second term to be negative so that I'm within the um, time average constraint. But on the other hand, if the virtual Q is not very long, I can probably afford to violate um, the average constraint a little bit so that um, taking the average over a long time, then I can still be within that constraint. So now putting this um, together um, into the original algorithm, this uh, FlexFL algorithm that we've presented before. So essentially what we do is like, um, so we, add some of these solutions 
put to the three problems into that algorithm, and we still run the remaining of the algorithm. So what we have here is like, remember in the algorithm, we have these three parameters, Q, V, and U. Um, v and U, they are the vectors transmitted from client to the server, and then here from server to the client. And then uh, Q is the probability of uh, participation or computation at a certain round. So these three parameters are now determined by this uh, this control algorithm that includes solving these optimization problems. And these ones now, they are first lot optimization problems, meaning that we don't have this problem of looking forward um, to see what will happen in the future because now we have an online algorithm that can um, give an approximate solution by only looking at the current state of the system. So we determine these values using um, this um, or by solving this con these three problems and plugging in those into the original algorithm, then basically we can have a way to control these parameters and at the same time to guarantee that um, uh, we can train the model efficiently and at the same time uh, ensure that uh, the, um, the cost constraints that we specified here, they are satisfied. Right, so this is just some performance analysis of this algorithm. Um, there are some differences from a standard Lyapunov optimization approach. For example, here we consider a finite T because when you train a model, you don't want to train a model forever. This is a bit different from some networking control um, problems where you could kind of assume that the system is running forever, but for model training, we want to finish it after a certain amount of time. And uh, the other challenge in the analysis is uh, that uh, the decisions are time correlated because when we look at these vectors B and A, they, they include this residual error terms and those are accumulated over time. So for, those, for, for that reason, we cannot get an exact form of the trade-off between optimality and constraint satisfaction except for um, the computation related term that includes the variable Q here because Q is not depending on previous decisions, but we can still get some meaningful results um, in this case. But what's interesting, if you look at this is like, um, so this is capturing the constraint violation and we can um, see that it's always upper bounded by a quantity. And um, here in this algorithm, we have these control uh, hyperparameters V and W. Uh, v is um, the parameter V in these optimization problems, and W is the initial Q length for the virtual queues. So what we can see here is that uh, W mainly affects the performance in initial slots because uh, T square is of a higher order compared to T. So that means if T is large, then this term will become dominating. Um, so V would affect the long-term performance uh, but if, if T is small, then W would affect um, the performance in the short term as well. So the same here is like you have um, a T in the denominator here, but you don't have T in the denominator here. All right, so looking at some of the uh, results that we obtained from experiments. Uh, so in this case, we compare with a baseline that performs a top case classification of a given percentage and we've designed it in the way that um, we still satisfy all the average computation and communication cost constraints because that's the only way it makes sense for a comparison. But what we can see here is that if we use our, uh, the algorithm that we just described, then we can get the higher accuracy for both the fashion MNIST and the CFR10 data sets. And at the same time, we can um, get close to the target uh, cost constraint. And so basically that's the time average cost constraint that we, we have. I think here we said um, um, the communication cost constraint is, is probably a hundred for all these cases. So that's our target. But um, if we train it for a, a thousand iterations, we could afford to violate 
is a bit in the beginning, but in the end, uh, we will converge to the average cost constraint. So now this is um, the result for different V and W. So as we said, uh, V primarily controls the constraint violation uh, with some kind of a longer term impact and W has more shorter term impact. And this is shown here. So like if you choose different Ws for fixing of V, then uh, you will change the um, initial constraint violations um, depending on what values of W you choose. But at the end, everyone is getting to the same value. If you cho choose different V values, you will still change it similar in a similar way, but it's, it just have um, some long-term behavior compared to um, tuning of W. So in practice, you could tune these two parameters depending on um, how much violation you could probably afford. So now um, let's move to the next topic just quickly. Um, so one problem with the approach that I just described is that um, so, so we, we have this um, probability of computation that is captured by Q, but what if a client is disconnected, let's say for an extended period of time? So if the client is disconnected, uh, we should say that we don't allow the client to do any computation. And in this case, mathematically, we could say that there's an infinite computation cost Whenever you choose this client with any probability, so um, whenever Q is larger than zero, there's an infinite computation cost. But at the same time, if um, you choose Q is equal to one, then you would have an infinite convergence error because the first term is what appeared in the convergence error. Right? So that means if, if in this a more challenging case where some of the clients are disconnected, maybe you cannot directly use what you have before. And what it turns out is that we need to make some further adjustments to the federated averaging algorithm so that it can actually work well in this case. And um, the reason is shown in this illustrative example. For example, in this example, we have um, a very simple local objectives um, that's defined in the following way. So you have local optimal points T1, T2, and T3 here. And then let's say we have three clients participating cyclically um, and uh, in each round only one client participates. So that means in round one, I will move the original parameter. Uh, this is parameter uh, initialization X zero. So I will move a bit towards Z one and then I will move a bit towards Z two and then I'll move a bit towards Z three, right? So, um, and, and, and then we use a, this is what we usually call a two-sided learning rate in federated averaging. So we have a local gradient descent step size, and we also have a global gradient descent, uh, descent step size. The local learning rate is denoted by gamma. The global learning rate is denoted by eta here. So what we, I mean, in this example here, currently eta is always equal to one. So we only have the local learning rate as in the original federated averaging algorithm. But the problem we see here is that if you choose a small learning rate, uh, let's say after 15 rounds, we get to a point that's uh, it's closer to X star, but it's uh, still uh, some uh, clear gap between X15 and X star. Um, but if you choose a larger learning rate, then the problem is that we end up cycling around the optimal point X stars, which is more obvious here, the learning rate is very large. And the reason is that when you reach to a point um, that is kind of surrounding X star, you will start moving towards X uh, Z1 and then move towards Z2 and then move towards Z3. The reason is that because in each round, only one of your clients are participating, right? So, so you will have this cyclic behavior um, if you use a standard federated averaging algorithm with a large learning rate, whereas if you use a small learning rate, you may just converge the optimal point slowly. So what can we do in this case? So the idea is to, um, first is to use this two-sided learning way. So that is that by itself is not new, but um, it's kind of new in the way that we use this because we use this across 
several rounds. Each round includes uh, some communication between the participating client and the server. We use um, this um, a global learning rate, which we call an uh, which we call as amplification factor over multiple rounds. Um, and then there's an interval um, that we can decide, like um, how often do I want to amplify the updates? And um, again, there's a participation weight. This this Q is similar to the Q that we have before, although with uh, some slight differences, but essentially is to say, um, or it's, it's, it's a way to capture, like if you have some clients or more clients participating, less clients participating, what should be the weight of these updates? Um, so with this amplification, um, the benefit that we see is, is like um, is shown again, the same example, but now we have eta equals to something that's larger than one. And we keep gamma, the local learning rate to be the smallest number that we had before. And what we can see is that if we use an amplification factor of five, let's say, I can reach very close to the optimal point X star within these 15 rounds. Of course, you don't have to train only for 15 rounds, but we just use 15 rounds as a way to come here. Because in the original, original example, regardless of what local learning rate you choose, you can never reach or convert to somewhere that's very close to the optimal point X star. But here, if we do an amplification, we can converge to X star very quickly. So this is like the main idea of amplifying local updates over multiple rounds in the case where some clients get disconnected for some long period of time, right? And then we did some analysis. Um, uh, the interesting part of this is that we can capture the effect of partial participation into only one term in this convergence upper bound. And then by analyzing this term, we can get a set of results. Um, these are just some standard assumptions that we make in most convergence an analysis work of uh, federated learning algorithms. Um, something that we do here is to decompose this gradient divergence term into three separate terms um, that I won't go into all the details, but basically, um, the third term is where the effect of partial participation becomes the most prominent. And um, they also appear in the main convergence results that we have. And then by further analyzing these um, delta terms in these two corollaries, what we can get essentially is a set of convergence rates that's shown in this table. Um, so we can basically have the rates for different participation patterns. The first one is regularized. It's like uh, within some key rounds, all the clients participate for the same amount of time, but they may not participate at the same time. So this is what we mean by regularized. Um, for example, you have, you probably have people in different geographical locations. They may only participate in training during the night when they are charging their mobile phones. And uh, this is what we call regular rights, and we can get a good convergence bound. For this case, using this generalized federated averaging algorithm with amplification, and this is actually matching a centralized HTTP lower bound, which means that as long as you have stochastic gradient noise, you cannot improve this bound further. And then uh, we also have um, results for some stochastic participation patterns, like. Um, if it's uh, following some ergodic process or some mixing process, such as a Markov chain, or if you independently sample each client uh, in every round. So we have similar results to this, although um, these ones are slightly worse than this because um, this, this has a constant term in the numerator. Okay, so let's get into the experimental results. Um, as what we've shown in the example, uh, here we are uh, running this on real data sets and models. And of course, that's much more complicated than the example that we showed. Uh, but again, we can see that the algorithm with amplification gives the best performance. And the other thing to note is that in this algorithm, we have this hyperparameter P. Uh, P is a 
kind of trying to capture the whole cycle of participation. So ideally, within P rounds, you would have uh, you or you would want to have other clients to have participated for almost the same amount of time. But what happens if in practice I may not be able to estimate P correctly? But what's interesting that we can see here is like so the ground truth P is 500, meaning this is an experiment with cyclic participation after 500 rounds. All the clients have participated for the same amount of time. But even if we choose P to be smaller than 500, like 300 or 100, we can still get a very similar performance or maybe sometimes even a better performance compared to choosing P um, to be equal to the ground truth cycle. But if you choose P equals to one, so this is basically the same as uh, the standard federated averaging algorithm, which does not amplify over multiple rounds. It might only amplify over one round, but if you choose P equals to one, we can see that the performance is much worse compared to the other P values. Right, um, so this is basically uh, the main part, um, or the main things that I would like to talk about. I have one more slide after this, just to put federated learning in a bit bigger picture. But here are two recent papers that um, are basically the works that I've talked about. These are the two topics. So one is an Infocom paper that will appear in May, and the other is a newest paper that appeared at the end of last year. So um, something that's also interesting, if you look at federated learning from a more practical perspective that we see in a lot of industry applications, is like, um, so, Many academic works have been talking about this basic failure learning process. So you have some local data, you want to use failure learning to train a model, and then you probably deploy the model somewhere, but maybe um, most people don't really care that much about deployment. Um, but in practice, what we see quite often is that, um, so this, this whole thing is actually an evolving process, right? meaning that once you have a basic model, uh, you may uh, collect new data from time to time, and then you would like to adjust the model further to fit into the new data. And you may want to use some continual learning methods um, just so that the model does not forget everything that it has learned before. You might need some model management capabilities, and you might do some personalization to suit different user specific needs. And the user could also provide feedback, generate more data, and then the training goes on and on and on. And this is also one reason why we want to make these things efficient, because it's not like we train it once and it's done. Right? We, we, we want this federated learning procedure to be a, an ongoing procedure that can always happen if needed with a minimum amount of additional resource consumption. So this is what we want. And um, that's why we have been looking at all these different uh, resource limitations in some of the recent works that I just presented. And of course, in the end, we may have an even more complicated system where you just have multiple agents and human users that all interact with each other, all learn from each other from time to time, and so on. All right, so just to recap, um, so we've talked about flexible failure of learning uh, with um, arbitrary communication and computation rates. We use the convergence upper bound as a surrogate to uh, optimize uh, this whole procedure to find the best computation and communication rates under average constraints. And we have uh, presented a drift plus penalty approach to solve this problem approximately. And then uh, looking at the specific problem of intermittent client participation, uh, we've um, explained why amplifying updates across multiple rounds improves the performance and also presented some convergence results um, in a unified framework that basically has a pluggable component um, capturing different types of participation patterns. And of course, in the end, uh, we've briefly talked about federal learning in a bigger picture. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Xi Qiang. It was a very interesting talk. So I think with this, we can open the